to be skillful, it is inconceivable not to have highly developed senses. Module 11, we focus on the sensory motor processes that contribute towards skillful performance. We will tackle each individual sensory systems and then end with overall concepts that are relevant as far as the sensory motor interaction. As we finish up with all the rest of the modules of this course, it is all about skillfulness. And in the service of refining motor skills, whether that skill is a fine motor skill to the left or perhaps something menial as um, arm wrestling, the um, role of senses in performance cannot be uh, trivialized. We begin with key terms that you, we will be using throughout this chapter. Sensation. Sensation is the rawest form of signal. It's the stimulation of a sensory receptor and basically it's an electrical event or some people say electromechanical event where a neural transmission of information transpires. From the periphery, it sends a signal to the central nervous system. As it reaches the higher centers of the brain, the next level of processing is perception. This is uh, applying meaning to the information that was received. Sensory integration ramps it up to the next higher level of processing. It means that old and new information are integrated. Information from multiple sources are co information from multiple sources coalesce to produce the final picture. When we think of sensory sources, we begin with the exteroceptive type, meaning it is outside of the body and uh, mediated by the environment. For vision, in an environment where there is light, uh, the eyes function. For audition, where the environment provides sound. Um, tactile, skin is the primary medium through which information is translated. Uh, it's a som somatosensory type. It also means coming from outside of the body. However, the term somatosensory could also refer to something that is interoceptive. Interoceptive or proprioceptive, meaning the source of the information is from within the body. This refers to information that uh, indicate body position or about the motion itself. Often not fully understood, even by exercise science students, we talk about the vestibular system and the somatosensory system that is internal. We begin with vision, probably the most powerful sense, because once it is there, it tends to um, overwhelm the rest of the other senses. The chart on the left is what is called the Snellens chart. But which type of specific vision does these measure? Each one has at some point sat in a doctor's office and been tested with uh, how accurate our vision is. We start from the top with that big letter E. Because this is static, because this has to do with ac visual acuity, in other words, clarity of image, is this enough for movement? We call the two types of vision. One is to do with peripheral vision or ballistic vision. The other one has to do with um, visual guidance or clarity of vision, so focal vision. That This one tests the latter. To differentiate what it means to visually sense something as opposed to visually perceive something, the slide shown here will differentiate sensation from perception. This is drawn by a person who has a pathological condition. In other words, there is a clinical diagnosis involved. Something is wrong. Based on the picture, something is missing. Take note of the missing left eye, the much sparser hair on the left side of the head, tilted, it doesn't have a nostril, the ear, nothing like the earrings that's depicted on the right side. This is echoed on the other drawing, but this time of the whole body. It misses the whole shoulder and arm. The breasts are tilted, left side, 
the hips are missing and even if this is already just a stick figure it's still missing out something on the legs this is a condition called the visual neglect syndrome typically it happens to stroke patients for those who have damage on the right parietal area given our knowledge of decussation it means the crossing of the signals everything that is dysfunctional is expressed on the left side so it's a right brain syndrome the right parietal lobe participates in locating objects in space who are these people who have this visual neglect syndrome stroke patients who have massive stroke on the right side of their brain typically withdraw even the clock either it's missing everything on the left side or bunches up the number on the right side are these people blind no they're not so the senses at the the simplest form the sensation is not impaired the peripheral mechanism to translate information coming from the outside of the body heading towards the central location of the brain nothing is wrong this person can see the minute the information heads to the occipital lobe or the visual area that's where things fall apart which means the right parietal area is a higher center all of that perception is a second third fourth tear processing and that is the one that's disturbed so you separate sensation from perception and this becomes evidence in a lot of pathological condition to exercise science students what is key for us are visual perception abilities designed for movement clearly a basketball player has to have good depth perception or the golfer in making that final putt so what is required to um, enhance or to refine depth perception? Does it even start during infancy? It turns out that children have a concept of depth as early as uh, nine months. This is the classic experiment by Gibson and Gibson. Um, this is the visual cliff study. The baby is is resting on a visual cliff this is a plexiglass that's clear but because of the checkered pattern they created a cliff and the idea is for the mother to cajole the child to cross over the cliff if they have depth perception they will not if they if they don't they simply cross over mm, very interesting experiment to this day the paradigm is being used uh, for other experiments bottom line is when you have children who are not as experienced who haven't had um visual stimulation in in a, in a sense that they perceive depth uh, all they see is mom as soon as the kids have a little bit more experience and they've they've uh they've stood up they've uh crawled and creeped when they see mom on the other side beyond nine months they start um, feeling that plexiglass it's as though the cognitive machine is rolling they know something is there and they're standing on it but they're disturbed by the visual cliff and it's with a lot of hesitation and likely um, finally not crossing that cliff despite mom being across from a mechanistic point of view, what are required to have depth perception? This requires visual acuity. Notice that I have not defined visual acuity yet, but you have some sense of the, th the importance of focal vision in this one. In other words, it requires clarity of image so that you produce that illusion of depth. It also requires binocular vision. Binocular vision is uh, the phenomenon of resolving what we see with two eyes into one concrete image do a very quick um, experiment right now put your thumb right in front of you and stretch out your elbow as you look at that thumb away from your body it is one image as you bring it closer and closer and closer towards your nose you start having double vision 
Well, you, have you ever wondered how we are able to see one single image and yet you guys know full well that you have a pair of eyes? But that's called binocular vision. Your brain is able to resolve it in a way that's, um, if you think about it, is one of the most fascinating functions of the in the human body. Second important uh, visual perception process in sport, probably in exercise, is figure ground separation. Any activity where we have to intercept the ball or we have to interact with an implement and a ball is a fertile ground for discussing this. Point is, you have an object focus, and the idea is to be able to separate that from the background. Think in terms of beach volleyball. When you are on the side facing the sun, how are you able to separate the ball from the background of the sky with a brilliantly shining sun? It's quite difficult. As adults, you have the ability to do that. Children, on the other hand, even without that uh, extreme condition of the sun being in your eyes, for any sport, as I said, that they have to intercept the ball, tennis, lacrosse, badminton, how are you able to pluck that ball out of the air, separating it from the rest of the background? It involves a major skill in anticipatory timing and eye-hand coordination. Bottom line, this is one of the most complex skills. It takes a number of years for it to mature. While it begins early from four to six years old, do not expect your four-year-old to be able to catch balls really well. It takes time and between around eight to 12 years, it reaches its uh, at least full function. Switching over to auditory perception. We begin with vision because we're discussing all the senses that receive information from outside of the body. For auditory perception, we are thinking in terms of sound. What becomes evident is that low frequency sounds develop first. For infants, low pitched voices are the first ones as far as their preferred mode of hearing. Um, something that's very applied here. Most mothers will think that, that their babies hear mom's voice. Ironically, empirical data show that it is dad's voice that is preferred, low-pitched voices. With development coming full circle, is it any surprise that the elderly again has the same preference for low-pitched voices? So, as far as development is concerned, the cells inside the inner ear that processes sounds tends to process low frequency sounds earlier. For the elderly, as they've come full circle, um, the preference for low pitched voices remains. Note that in between, from infancy to older adulthood, Individuals have developed the capability to process high-pitched sounds. Is it any surprise, though, that towards the end of life, it is the first to go? So, think of how you can have a practical application for this. Do fathers have more to contribute as far as uh, raising that child? Yours are the voices. Fathers are the voices that infants are, have a natural preference. So it means that it is more soothing for them to hear dad's voice in the early part of development. Same way as you get older, don't you notice that grandparents have a harder time hearing granddaughters as opposed to grandsons? Somatosensory system, the skin, specifically the ex exteroceptive type. Um, in the large scheme of things in terms of sensory, um, processing in the brain, each area is um, indicated here. The yellow part, which is the concern for motor behavior, is the motor cortex. Behind it, directly behind it, is the sensory cortex. Here is the nose. Uh, imagine the nose on this side, by the way. The red part is the occipital area to process vision. In the light blue, gustatory, it's not really our concern. Auditory is a big concern because audition and vision tend to work together in real life situations. Um, olfactory, we will not be concerning ourselves with that.
Bottom line is, if you look at the big swath of um, brain cells that are related to motor and sensory, they are alongside each other. We understand what big role the skin has to play. Every part of the body is represented here. It's what you call a somatotopic map. Um, if one is to base the representation of body parts based on the number of cells that are devoted to that skin, you might think that the humanoid looks like this. The cells within the face and the hands and the thumb in particular are oversupplied in both the motor and the sensory cortices. In other words, there are so much nerve endings in your thumb alone. Combine that with the ones in the mouth and the lips. Does it surprise you that infants, babies, up to maybe about five, love thumb sucking? It appears to be a ritual that most kids have gone through. Few have not. But what does that do? Why do kids um, tend to uh, suck thumb during the process of development? Um, it is because sensation has a way of calming us down. It is a way for the child to um, kind of get its bearings. Uh, as adults, what is a parallel event where you, where adults thumb suck? You'll be surprised if you look at the lessons of history. During World War I and World War II, when they found uh, soldiers that were, a vic that were victims of the war, in their dying moments, most of them assumed fetal position and almost at a point where they were uh, sucking their thumbs. So sensation is a powerful thing. Skin is the largest sensory organ in terms of acreage, in terms of what it covers as far as all the nerve endings that bring data to the brain. In addition, sensory system develop earlier than the motor system. It's as though being able to move is preceded by the ability to feel. Of course, they interact, but sensory cells in general develop before motor cells. With respect to somatosensory information, bridging the exterative senses into the interoceptive senses, I begin with muscle spindles. Somatosensory, this time resident inside the body. And you have been repeatedly told that there are only five senses because these are senses that tend to get their information from outside of the body. As exercise science students, you know you've gone beyond that very simple representation of senses. If I may submit, this is the sixth sense. Uh, not of seeing dead people. The sixth sense have to do with being able to detect movement, movement without outside information. It is internally produced. In other words, there is something inside the body that detect motion and detect amount of muscle stretch. Um, I'll have a picture of this in a short while, but let me run, run through all the elements that contribute to what I call the sixth sense. Golgi tendon organs. These are the senses that are resident, not inside the muscle like the muscle spindles are, but in the tendon. Uh, yeah, they detect tendon load. And joint receptors, these are the receptors inside the joint capsule. They detect joint position and joint angles. Finally, there are nerve endings, the Ruffini fibers. These are the ones that are involved with tactile information. Some of them are internal too, but I just needed to point this out in the complex of, some of this, the somatosensory sensation, although this more properly uh, belongs to the exteroceptive uh, sources. Here is um, here's a figure that uh, demonstrates what the muscle spindle looks like. Inside the belly of the muscle fiber, you have um, you need a mechanism that allows stretch for the muscle, regardless of whether it is a contracted state or at an extended state. 
regardless of the initial position of the muscle, there is something inside the belly, which is called the muscle spindle, that detects the stretch. Any stretch will be reacted to by a contraction. Most of you know this as the stretch reflex. In terms of applying this to real life situation, why would you not want to warm up with ballistic stretching? Well, that's because in the end, you're not getting any stretches because what all you did was to invoke the stretch reflex. If you stretch the muscle in a way that is very fast and ballistic, the internal sensors or the muscle spindle detects this and reacts in a self-preservative mode. There is a motor neuron inside that keeps this muscle spindle, you call this the muscle bag, and then there's a chain there that keeps this whole mechanism taut. In other words, it's always stretched regardless of the initial position of the actual muscle. It will feed back into the nerve ending that innervates the whole complex of the bigger muscle. So if you stretch it very fast, it will do a feedback loop and tell the whole big muscle complex to self-preserve. It's getting stretched too fast. It's going to recoil back. That's why it's called the stretch reflex. Okay? It's a good thing to have. Do you realize it is this mechanism that allows us to right ourselves when we, um, for example, are about to slip when somebody trips us, when some unexpected surface change happens while you're running from hard pavement to the beach, for example, essentially all of our muscles in the depth of the muscle belly, we have this mechanism called muscle spindle that prevents the body from not being able to handle those unexpected stretches. Moving on towards the vestibular system, again, most of you know this as the system involved for balance control. We kind of talked about this when we discussed reflexes. When we discussed reflexes, we alluded to the labyrinthine reflex because um, the complex inside the inner ear, uh, physically it looks like a labyrinth. Essentially, there are liquids in there that allow us to detect position in space. They correspond to the planes of motion that we are capable of exploring. Uh, think about your biomechanics. When you represent movements, the three-dimensional scale involves an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. Well, those three canals are oriented, are oriented in exactly the same way. Those three canals terminate, however, to two bulbous structure in the whole apparatus, the utricle and the saccule. I'll have a picture in a short while. Bottom line, the three canals along with the utricle and saccule detect rotation and direction of motion, especially since they're housed in the head. Where the head goes, the body follows. Remember that from reflexes? We think in terms of locating the head and being able to detect how quickly that head is being spun around. Um, here is a picture of the semicircular canals. And as I said, they terminate in this bulbous structure called utricle and saccule. By the way, this is a separate mechanism altogether with regards to the hearing complex. The rest of this here is about hearing. It is not to say they are not related. If you think about the kids who are hearing impaired, the likelihood is they also have balance problems. Um, something to take away here as far as uh, a practical thing to consider as parents. When you have children who have ear infection, do not trivialize this. The minute there is an infection in this area, it will likely affect this area. And, and quite, it is quite common in daycare centers when you have children, when you have a child that has a, an ear infection, it will tend to pass it on to the other kids. Prolonged ear infection compromises or at least, put, at least puts all of these complexes in major risk. 
body and directional awareness. I introduced to you a term that we'll be using towards all the rest of the way towards building motor skills, segmental differentiation. Another substitute word there is disso dissociation. Think in terms of what to you define skillful performance. If you have skillful per performance, it means that body parts don't all go one way. A piano player playing the scales for the right and left hands, hitting the same notes, da 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 you know, and then doing the scale. That is not as skillful as actually playing a melody on your right hand and playing a bass uh, sequence on the left hand, making a harmony between the right and left hands. Well, it's the same with sport. Let's take one of the most difficult shots in basketball, the sky hook. It means being able to detect your location in space, detect what your right arm is doing as it is performing the sky hook, but the left hand is trying to maintain balance and the legs are able to jump accordingly, achieving the right height in the right direction. That is what segmental differentiation means. It is an indicator of skillfulness. But when does it emerge? Uh, we have an experiment. This is an experiment that I was involved in. Um, when we tested kids in separating the primary movement from the synergistic movements, um, we asked very young kids, three to four year olds, to perform a waitering task. Those of you who have uh, jobs as servers in a restaurant, you do know that there, it involves major parallel tasking. Okay, while you're handling the tray on your right hand, you're navigating a room full of drunk people, you are uh, trying to give change, getting money back, leaning forward to serve the person. In this case, with three to four year olds, uh, we cannot let them we, they don't want to cooperate with us pretending to be waiters, but they would gladly blow bubbles for us. So in the same vein, the left hand here in this, um, in this picture is holding, think of that as representing the tray. They're holding a tray, in this case it's a bottle, and they lean forward to blow the bubble. That was the instruction. What position here could be the most perturbing? We start out in this experiment with this bottle full. What do you think happens as the child leans forward? Obviously it will spill. So at that age, it's a series of experiments. I do not have time to explain the complexity of this paradigm, but as far as being able to segmentally differentiate what the left hand is doing to what the rest of the body is doing at three to four years old, children are not skillful yet. Um, they are, they, this child spilled it all over, over and over again, this spike, you know, she's wondering why am I getting wet? So bottom line, the skill of segmental differentiation is not yet present in very young, um, kids. If the question is, when does it emerge, uh, another, um, another setup that we can, uh, use to kind of imply when this, uh, skill emerges. Um, I'll have to ask you to look at this picture on the right. Again, a very good platform to test this is bicycle riding. By the way, bicycle riding is one of those skills. Not only is it a rite of passage, but it is a rich ground for testing motor skills because uh, the balance skills involved uh, are tremendous. Here is a kid. Okay, let's start with a scenario. The kid is on her bike. She's looking left. She's signaling right off the top of your head. For those of you who ride your bikes, tell me everything that is wrong in this picture. She is signaling right. She is, she's supposed to be able to dissociate what her right hand does to what her left hand does. Look in terms of the totality of the objective of the skill. She's wanting to turn right, her left hand is on the handlebar, but uh, you can tell from the angle and the, the tire at the bottom that because the left hand is 
uh, oriented relative to where she is looking, what do you think happens the minute she pedals? Assume this is the real street. Obviously, it's not. This is a setup. If this is a real road where there are cars um, streaming through that main road that she is trying to merge at, the minute she pedals, she runs straight towards the traffic. To begin with, she is signaling with the wrong hand. Those of you who have ridden your bikes, and if you know how to ride properly, following the rules, same rules as cars uh, follow. When, when you're in your bike, all your signals have to be visual. You're supposed to do that with your left hand. Okay? So this kid, if you estimate, probably about eight years old, still not there. Segmental differentiation. It is a skill that needs to be taught. It is a skill that needs to be refined. Just as bicycle riding is a serious event, it is not meant to be a toy. Bikes are a form of transportation, which means you are going to hang with the big boys, with the cars on the roads. As far as perception is concerned, we'll continue on with our perception and motion um, linkages. Think about how we see things. It really depends on where we're coming from, okay? If you're viewing this cylindrical object from this side, the shadow you will it creates is that of a circle. Without seeing where that shadow is coming from, you are likely to think, oh, it must be a ball, something that has volume, uh, perhaps, or maybe it's just flat. It doesn't matter. It has to have some circumference. On the other hand, if light is coming this way, and you're looking merely at the shadow on this side, you will think it's a cube or a square. So when it comes to sensation movement dynamics, perception affects action and action perception. It is a two-way street. When you referring back to that figure, I mean, we have the benefit of seeing the possibility, but in real life, if you think about what you see, the richness of our ability to interpret the things that come into our visual field comes from experience. We've handled it all. We've moved, we've acted, we've perceived. The idea is we are a building, iterating ball of senses and movement. We are constantly measuring up, analyzing and figuring things out in the, bigger, in the grander scheme of things. Perception and action go together. It is never one way. It is easy to conceive that it's typically only one way. I see, therefore I act. I perceive, therefore I behave in a certain way. But think about uh, a very good golfer making a putt. When they look at that ball's path towards the cup, they line their putts. Notice, however, good golfers never stay in one place. What do they do? They act in order to perceive. Classically, a golfer will walk around the path, will walk around the greens and analyze the slope of the green, the direction that the ball may take. Probably it's a single breaker or a double breaker. Bottom line, you cannot buy this kind of skill without a lot of practice and without a lot of interaction between action and perception and perception and action. Bottom line, active participation is necessary for skill acquisition and skill refinement. This was classically demonstrated by Heldon Hein. Heldon Hein used kittens to demonstrate the role of action and being just passive. This is the active kitten, kitten A. He is wearing a collar so that they don't see their limbs. All they see is the result of what they are performing, not necessarily the appendages uh, that they use to perform the task. This is the passive kitten or the passenger kitten. Likewise, can't see the legs, but all that he does is sit around. The active kitten drives this, uh, not pulley, but this mechanism around and around, uh, like a uh, merry-go-round. When the experiment was done, which kitten do you think was skillful? By the way, they, there are tests for kittens, just as uh, B.F. Skinner has tests for, for uh, worms and owls and whatever you have. Uh, clearly, 
if you are to take away anything from this module, if you have, if you're training kids, the more rich the experience is, the more active they become, not only in the actress performance, but the actual thought processes that go in, into the performance where they are, you give them room to think, you give them room to analyze. It will be all for the better. When it comes to the overall goal, it's all about skillfulness. Thank you.